welcome to Second Opinion, a new show from the Los Angeles Times focusing on health, science, and technology. I'm Eli Stokels. I'm a White House reporter in the paper's Washington Bureau, but here I'll be moderating what will be a compelling and important discussion between two leading lights of the medical and public health fields on the biggest subject of our day, the coronavirus pandemic. Dr. Patrick Soon-Shiong is the executive chairman of the Los Angeles Times. He's also a surgeon and scientist who has spent his career studying the human immune system in order to fight cancer and infectious disease. Dr. Soon-Shiong is the chairman and CEO of the biotech company Nantworks and the owner or investor in other companies researching treatments for COVID-19. We're also joined tonight by William Hazeltine, a noted biologist and a former professor at Harvard's Medical School and School of Public Health. Professor Hazeltine is an expert in the human immune system known for his groundbreaking research on cancer and HIV AIDS. He is the founder and CEO of biotech companies responsible for drugs treating cancer, HIV and AIDS, diabetes, and other diseases, and is the chair and president of a nonprofit think tank called Access Health. Professor Hazeltine is also an author. His most recent book is called A Family Guide to COVID, Questions and Answers for Parents, Grandparents, and Children. Dr. Soon Shang and Professor Hazeltine, welcome to you both. We're so glad to have you with us for this discussion. Uh, Dr. Soon Shang, you've wanted to do a show like this for some time, particularly since the beginning of this pandemic. There were hopes that this would be one wave and that it would be controlled. California in particular stood out back then, was credited for having taken early action and ordering closures. And while cases were soaring in New York, California really was avoiding the worst of it. Now, though, California leads the country for new cases. The LA Times coronavirus tracker tells the story. The confirmed case number is growing, as is, unfortunately, the death toll. And the impact is disproportionate. Latino and Black residents of LA County contract the virus more often than white residents do. And once they have the virus, they are dying more often than white residents as well. In the meantime, the phased reopening that Governor Gavin Newsom set in motion in May and June is now being rolled back. With Dr. Soon Chong, to begin, take us through why this program is so important. Why does everyone need to know about this virus? And perhaps you can discuss a little bit too about the track we're on and why this resurgence is taking place. Thank you for having us, Eli. And, um... Dr. Helsentin, thank you for being with us today and um, this inauguration of this show, Second Opinion, I think is so important that we have science directly speak, uh, science and medicine. This is a pandemic, this is an infection of our time. Um, it's historic and it's so important for the public to understand that this is something different. It is so sad that actually, uh, as Governor Newsom was the first governor to shut down the state, that unfortunately, I think we opened too soon. But I think there was also a combination of the fact that the behavioral change of our community, the idea that they should wear masks and socially distance and have the ability to really tamp down was an opportunity lost. But this is not just an opportunity lost as if it's a football game or a basketball game. These are lives you begin to sort of see now. I think why I want this to have this stage of us coming out and speaking very forcefully is to explain to the community not only how serious this is, but they as a community, as a community of Los Angelinos, can truly change the pattern of where we are. And I think one of the things that disturbs me most is I see the young people without masks, socializing on the beach. And the concept is, I'm young, this is flu, I'll get the disease, we'll get herd immunity, and I'll be fine. I want to really put out the facts that this is not that case. This is a dangerous disease. It affects multiple organs. We have no idea of the long-lasting effect. There's now evidence that if you're asymptomatic, is a significant percentage of patients that have this thing called ground glass. I've been asked, what is ground glass? Well, these are really inflammatory responses into your lung. We don't know what will happen one year, two years, five years from now. This virus hits every part of the body, the heart, the lung, the pancreas, the blood vessels, the brain. 
We don't know what's going to happen to those that are asymptomatic. So I think it is important for us to put out, without scaring the community, but really put out the facts that this is a dangerous disease, but yet we as a community can change that. I think that's why this is such an important um, show that we're putting out, and that's why um, doctors like Dr. Hasselton can give his view, uh, and I could give my view of what are the important facts for us to understand here and now. Well, thank you, Patrick. And uh, I fully agree with uh, your assessment of the gravity of this situation. This is a disease that affects the entire population. To some extent, people have sent the message out that if you're young, you're invulnerable. That isn't true. You just have to look at who's in the hospital today, who's in the morgue today. Those are people who are young, 30, 40, uh, some people in their 20s. We hear that children aren't vulnerable. Well, about 250,000 children in the United States have been infected. And while it's true that they don't get the disease the same way adults get the disease, when they do get the disease, it's the very, very worst form. That's what we don't want to happen. Now, a lot of people are confused about transmission. How does this virus get around? There's a very simple way of thinking about it. This virus is a member of the cold virus family, just as polio is a member of a cold virus family of the coronaviruses. And many people can get it, and a few people get the really serious symptoms from this. But we all know how colds are transmitted. I'm a parent, and I'm now a grandparent, and I can tell you the way I get my colds. When I was a parent, I sent my kids to school and they came back and they gave me a cold. As I'm a grandparent, when my grandchildren go to school, they come back from school, they give me a cold. That's how you get it. That's one real way. So the idea that children are gonna be spared and that the issue that's foremost in everybody's mind today is schooling, is serious. How can you think of sending your kid to school right now when there is so much infection around? So. I agree fully with Patrick. This is a disease that has to be reckoned with really seriously. We've seen what happened when we opened too early. We have a really major infection going on. Do we really want to see an experiment with our children and our children's life to send them back to school too early? We know what happens to us when we move too early. Let's not let that happen to our children. Well, Professor, I want to continue on that uh, as we open this discussion up a little bit uh, on a lot of these critical issues related to the pandemic. The prospect of school openings, this is an issue that districts, that parents, administrators, teachers, everyone is confronting right now as summer sort of nears uh, the midway point and, and, and nears gets closer to Labor Day. And there do not seem to be uh, anything in districts such as a consensus right now, everyone is kind of operating based on what the caseload seems to be in a specific area, what the capacity is. Congress has been slow with the funding. Just from a public health standpoint, can you talk a little bit um, about what this should look like and what the people weighing these decisions at the local level, whether it's in Los Angeles or otherwise, what they should be looking at and prioritizing when they try to figure out what to do in terms of opening up schools or, or keeping students learning virtually? Let me just say, first of all, the issue, as you pointed out, is one that's a dinner table conversation for anybody who's a parent. And it's a very worrying conversation for anybody who's a grandparent. And so what's the other thing to, to say is, what do the real experts say, the people who've looked at this most deeply? We're fortunate. We have a wonderful National Academies of Sciences. All the sciences get together and they took their best minds and they wrote a report on school reopening. To me, it's the most troubling report I have ever read from the National Academy of Sciences. Why? Because they say we don't know the answer. They say we don't know what the real problem are with kids giving it to each other, to their teachers. We just don't have the evidence. And they point out that there's no instructions from the federal government. Nobody has a guidebook. The instructions that are given are very vague. They say, you know, they're more like questions than instructions. 
Do you, should you think about masks? Should you think about distancing rather than instructions? That is the state of play. And that reflects, I think, something Patrick and I have talked a lot about, which is what do you need in this kind of situation? You need leadership, which is clear, consistent, credible, and above all, compassionate. And we don't have that at our national level. We just don't have it. The second thing you need is an organization. And Patrick and I have talked a lot about the importance of contact tracing and having a public health service that's unified and gives messages across the country. We don't have that. It's been left up to governors and some governors have handed it over to the cities and there are fights between governors and cities all over the country. It's, we just don't have the organization. And then something Patrick mentioned in his, in his introduction, we need social solidarity. We have to protect each other. You can't have young people saying, I don't care if the old people or my kid sister gets infected. I'm going to go to a bar and get drunk. That's what they're doing. You can't have that. It's a tremendous rise in infections. Dr. Soon Chong, I wanted to ask you to pick up on that. Uh, obviously, politics is a big part of how Americans are viewing this. Just recently, we had the president decide to cancel the convention, the RNC, that was scheduled in Jacksonville because people were just not interested in going down there. But at the same time, he's continuing to advocate for schools to reopen. I want to go back to something that you mentioned in your, in your intro about not wanting to scare people, but the importance of the public actually internalizing a sense of fear uh, and, and being more humble, perhaps, about what we are facing with this virus. I know parents already have a lot on their plate as they try to consider what to do uh, about school and sending their kids back or keeping them at home. What would you tell those parents in terms of, you know, looking at this decision and looking at the real public health issues and the lack of clear leadership from Washington and in other communities? Uh, what would you advise for families that are, that are staring down the barrel of this decision? I think that's the purpose of the show. I think what Bill has said is the scariest thing is what we don't know. And, and I would like to maybe put up a slide about what we've just learned in three months. And if, unless you understand this particular science of how and where this virus goes, and this is a picture. When we first talked about, the, well, the earlier signs was loss of taste and smell, I thought that because it was hitting the mouth and the mucosa and hitting those receptors. But now I'm beginning to ask myself, is it actually hitting the brain? Is it hitting centrally? Why do people get tingling? Why do they get, uh, you heard people even go into depression? So it turns out this thing, these ACE receptors are in the brain. You hear all of a sudden in the ICU, uh, people having these blood clots and they're dying for blood clots in the heart and acute cardiac failure, and it turns out it's in the blood vessels. It's in the, and if you look, it's in the pancreas, it's in the liver, it's in the intestines, it's in the testes. It's, so this receptor where this virus is hit is all over the place, and we are learning as we speak. So if you look at this next uh, slide that I would like to show with you of the danger of how it could damage the body. It damages the heart, the blood vessels, the kidneys, the brain, it damaged the lungs, the intestines. So how, if we're only learning this now, could we responsibly say, um, it's okay, go to school, do this experiment, and let's see what happens. We're talking about generational, and we're talking about existential generational issues, for not for us, but for the children. So I can tell you, if I had a child when, uh, at that age, which I don't, or a grandchild, I personally would not recommend that they do this. I think we need to not only learn more, we need to understand more. But I want to take this slide of this damage and tell people who think they're asymptomatic, it turns out this virus is so brilliant. It comes in, it actually suppresses your immune system, so maybe that's why you feel well, but it begins to eat you from the inside out. So I think this is what the danger is. It's not hyperbole in terms of scaring. We are learning the science. So my advice is, please, follow the science. And we're trying to make the science understandable. It's very complex. 
but trying to make it understandable. And what Bill said is absolutely right. If we had leadership that followed the science and rather than follow the politics, and for us to make mask a political issue, which is the craziest thing when in fact it's one of the most effective things that we now know because this is a respiratory disease. It is infective by droplets. And this whole concept of droplets is a whole other issue of this six feet. Six feet is really an arbitrary thing. So the advice that I would give to parents is the science, we are just learning the science, the science is saying to us this is highly infective um, and we just need to be patient and, and, and until we can reduce the numbers, hold it down and then do complete, as Bill will talk about, lockdown of those patients that are infected and assume that everybody is, that's around us that is in contact with the person is infected. This is 20 times more infective than the first SARS-CoV and maybe even more so today as this virus mutates. So uh, my advice would be listen to programs that have true scientific apolitical meaning uh, and this national science report that Bill refers to is scary because the truth is we do not know. So if you do not know, let's do no harm until we do know. And one of the things that, you know, we've heard from po politicians uh, expressing with confidence that young people are not affected by this, that it sounds like that maybe that's not a certainty, uh, that even if this is predominantly affecting more severely anyway, the elderly population, Americans over the age of 65, uh, that young people, kids going back to school, college students wanting to go to the beach, they can still get this uh, virus, can still... Uh, be really affected by it and can transmit it. Is that correct, Dr. Sunshan? Absolutely. I mean, I think this was the unfortunate um, myth that was put out. This is just flu, sniffles, and if you're young, 99% will be fine. It turns out these people are dying. If you look at the numbers in the United States today, the average age that's in the ICU is, is dropped. And so whether this, because the virus mutates, or whether, whether in fact the demographics of, of now the infectivity. And as I said, there's a paper out, and maybe Bill can speak to this, over 57% of asymptomatic people, young people, have this ground glass. And what is ground glass? It's really these white spots in your lung that we don't know what's gonna to happen to those white spots over time. Will it become cancerous? Is this as if you were smoking a 20 pack, or is this at like asbestos? Um, will you have COPD at the end? Um, why do you get tingling in your body? Is it, is there, and, and by the way, does this virus actually sit there like HIV? Does it hide somewhere in your immune system? We don't know these things yet. So I think they're playing, young people are playing Russian roulette with their lives uh, for this particular period of, what, a week of fun. Um, as opposed to really trying to understand that if you're a patient and really work together as a community, we can actually win together. Professor Hazeltine, I want you to pick up on that uh, thread, and I want to ask you uh, if you can speak to a little bit why you believe the United States has struggled with this pandemic in a way that most other developed countries uh, have not seemed to. We are now uh, far past where we were when we thought the curve was coming down. We're now in a second curve that's much higher, uh, while a lot of European countries, Asian countries have seen their, their caseloads really drop. Why do you think that is? What elements of will or wherewithal have we uh, as a country been, been missing? Let me first pick up the uh, theme that you were on, which is young people being uh, sure. exposed. When you think about sending kids to school, most people think about the young kids, K through six. We know that they're less infectable. That doesn't mean not infectable. A lot of them will get infected, will carry the infection home. Some of them will get deathly ill and some of them will die. That is the fact. The other kids, kids who are in uh, junior high school and high school are about as susceptible as adults. They transmit it like adults. They can get sick like adults. Their biology is very different. And so when you're talking about school, you better talk about K through 12. And then you have to talk about colleges, which are fully adult. 
So it's a whole issue that is confusing and unresolved, and it's driving people completely nuts, as I think it should. There's no really clear answers right now, and there won't be in the next few weeks either. So the question is, you've asked a, a really complicated sociological political question. I'm going to answer it in a, in a sort of a, a maybe an unexpected way. I'm a virologist, and I've lived and studied with viruses all my life. Uh, HIV, you name it, all sorts of viruses. Uh, herpes viruses, many kind of viruses I've worked on, hepatitis. Viruses all have their own strategy. And you have to think about them as code crackers. They try to adapt to their environment. Now, in this case, we're the environment. We're the ecological niche. This virus has cracked our immune system. It can get into us. And as uh, Patrick said, it turns down our immunity. And that helps it get in. It helps it get out. And by the way, may make us reinfectable. It's cracked our immune systems. And it can come back and back and back again. It's cracked our sociology how we live together. And as we look over the world, this cracks something else that is totally unexpected, which is our political systems. That was not expected. This virus has figured out there's some places that are great for it. America is the promised land for this virus. Why? Because of our political system, because of the way we've structured our government, and because of our own psychology that we are the kings of our domain and we can do what we want without necessarily regard to others. The virus has cracked that code. And so when it gets into some countries, it has leadership that tells them what to do. It has a public health system, which is a unified public health system. And it has a group of people who have a sense of responsibility toward one another. But the virus is in Valhalla here. That is a horrifying realization, that you have an essentially intelligent machine, which is what a virus is. It's throwing random mutations all the time, trying to figure out how to get on best. It's, a, it's an intelligent machine. It's cracked our code. It's cracked the American code, the Brazilian code, and the Indian code. Now, those are all separate realities, but it hasn't cracked the, the South Korean code, the New Zealand code, the Chinese code. So humans can respond, but not all humans are organized to respond effectively. That's probably a different answer than you expected, but it, a virologist's perspective on the differences amongst countries and how the viruses adapts to that. Dr. Sun Chung, I wanna get your take on this too, and I wanna focus, if we can, a little bit on South Korea, uh, which the professor mentioned. We know that that was a hotspot early on and was successful in curbing this pandemic and they attributed their success to rigorous testing and contact tracing. That we know has not happened here in the US. Maybe you can address uh, why that is the case here. Eli, before I do that, I, I'm not only intrigued by Bill's answer, it's fascinating because I thought it, well, well Bill sort of from a perspective of a virologist as being an intelligent machine, which indeed it is, and that is crack this code. And I come from the view of maybe a biologist and a physician and a cancer researcher that in fact it has cracked this code like cancer because as Bill said this virus adapts it adapts to the human body just like cancer adapts so it takes the resistant cells and adapts that's what cancer does this virus has figured a way how to adapt to our human body this virus has figured out how to actually trick the immune system. This virus has figured out a way to actually take all these receptors that I shared that's in all parts of the body, called the ACE2 receptor, and occupy them and, and use the human body as an incubator. So if you all think about that, is the virus has adapted and used us as incubators to grow. And we can actually stop that growth because once we we don't incubate this virus, it doesn't have a host to spread. So that's how we need to think about it. We are the carriers of the virus. And this, I call this a genius virus, because it's found so many back doors. It's found a door through the ACE receptor of your lungs, but now it's even found a back door through your immune system. So it's, as you said, it's scary, it's cracked the code, but I never thought of it that way, the way Bill has put it. It's cracked even the political code. It's, it's cracked you know, our democracy because we have this 
freedom of spirit and freedom to move around and this federated system of not acting together. Once you're into that, this is why it is Valhalla. But we need to understand that. Having said that, if we understand the virus as if it were cancer and that's the way we're looking at it, then there is a way to get to this virus with what I call the B cell, the T cell, the memory T cell, the IgA antibodies, and we'll get into that with the vaccine or the therapeutics. So we, on the good news about that, so to, not to make this too scary, is because it is this intelligent machine, the human beings still have, and America is probably one of the most in innovative places, get maybe outthink it, outchest it, outplay it. But what we can't do is through our behavior, collective idiotic behavior, <laughs> uh, we play checkers and the virus is playing chess. And so this is why I think the difference is. Now in Korea, you asked about Korea and Bill can talk a little bit more about that because the healthcare system, that's what I've been trying to fight for for 20 years of my life, is an integrated systems generated healthcare system. They have a card. They know who you are as a patient. They know your health record. You put your card in, they know whether you, you've had a temperature. You put your card in, at the kiosk you get three, four, five masks. Uh, it is a way of actually tracing um, and actually providing support and integrating healthcare. That's one of the elements that we don't have. So I think what this virus has unearthed is this uh, disparate system of ours with a lot of perverse incentives where actually the underserved are the most hurt and that's why you see in the Latino population, the African American population, the, the Navajo nation, the Apache nation, why these people, the underserved, are most hurt. Because for the first time it's completely unveiled this disparity of our healthcare system. So it's a very complex issue but I think Bill has hit the, head, the nail on the head. When this is an intelligent machine, we have a way to outthink it, but we have to behave smartly. Well, and Professor, to the question about contact tracing, are we way past the point of being able to do that at this point, given where the caseloads are? And also given that, you know, everything we're hearing is that anybody who goes for a COVID test these days, it's taking seven, 10 days, maybe longer. Uh, to get the results back, seems like that would be something that would make it pretty hard uh, to effectively contact trace. Uh, you're right on all points. Uh, it is uh, past the point where it's easy to contact trace. Uh, there are far too many people uh, being infected, upwards of 70, now 80,000 a day. Uh, virtually impossible to contact that. Right now, the only way that we can control this is by shutting down major systems where the virus is hot, uh, shutting down our, any place where people can congregate, sending people, keep making people stay home, uh, have mandatory masks or face shields uh, to protect other people. It's the only way we're going to get this under control. If we don't get under control, what is happening today will look mild compared to what will happen tomorrow. This is nothing to mess around with. If you think that having 4 million people and the health consequences of that is bad, think of 10 times that if we don't get it under control. We know how to control it. This is not uncontrollable. Behavior change, people staying home, people wearing masks, people not congregating, we'll control it. But we have to do it. And the sooner we do it, the better off we'll be because every day we don't do it gives this virus an extra Hold and makes it even harder. I hope we get to the part of this conversation where we're a little bit more positive, because I think both Patrick and I think that our human intelligence will eventually outwit this, whether it's through a vaccine, whether it's through drugs. Um, some systems have already suppressed it to close to zero. Our European neighbors have suppressed it to, uh, as a continent, uh, several thousand a day, not several tens of or many tens of thousands. Uh, but eventually, I think uh, we will get through our intelligence to drugs to treat, drugs to prevent, and vaccines to prevent. And I think that Patrick is certainly well versed in all of that. Yeah, Dr. Soon-Shan, can you pick up on that and, and 
talk a little bit about where we are in this quest to, to get a vaccine. Um, and, and we'll come back to the professor on this as well. But, but where are we in the process? Uh, because it sounds like there are a lot of companies, a lot of folks racing to, to find this vaccine. Uh, but obviously, this is not a process that you can just jump to the end. It has to go through a lot of steps, it seems like. Let, let me um, pose this way, and maybe I'll put up the slide and the, the three stages of this disease, the yellow, orange, and red. And I think it's really important uh, to understand these three stages of the asymptomatic patient with an infected, the patient that has got symptoms, a flu-like patient, and the patient's in the ICU. And the reason I want to bring this up first is because the question of if you do get infected, have you basically vaccinated yourself? Are you, are you really vaccinated? Well, what is scary is this asymptomatic patient who, who are young and strong, and in fact, the younger you are, the better your immune system, you one would think. But it turns out that the patients that in the ICU that have the most severe disease have strong, what we call neutralizing antibodies, and the patients who are asymptomatic may get neutralizing antibodies, but they disappear. So as Bill talked about, this is what we call a coronavirus. The history of coronavirus is these antibodies disappear. So the question then is, where should we vaccinate? What should we, we should vaccinate? So if I go then to this slide to maybe speak about this virus, just a little bit about the structure of this virus, to go into this virus. So this virus, is what we call an RNA virus. And on the surface of the virus, it has the spike. And it is the spike that enters your body and hits this receptor. So it makes logical sense for everybody to think we go after spike and we'll create an antibody as a vaccine by injecting spike into your body. Your body will recognize the spike and say, well, this is far and I'm gonna make an antibody. And and stop it and block it. And that is what I would say 99% of the vaccine developers today are pursuing. I don't think that's a bad idea. It's a logical idea. It's there, but I have concerns. And the concerns is that spike mutates. These antibodies may not be long lasting. And then what? What happens, in fact, if you then have an antibody that maybe reduces your symptoms, but doesn't stop the infection. And now, you, are you going to become a super spreader? So these are questions that I, as a scientist, ask myself. So then, what is the solution? As you said, Bill said, we have to outthink this virus, because that spike is mutating as we speak. It's mutated now to the point that the little edge of it called the RBD, it's made it even more stable, and so it can infect even more. So as Bill said, this virus adapts to us. We are the host. But one of the things I'm convinced it can't do is the innards of that virus called the nuclear capsid, the N. And that innards of that virus is, is basically the engine that allows that virus to actually replicate itself. So if we were able to actually generate not just an antibody to end, but a T cell, which is a memory cell, which is the next portion of our immune system to N. And it turns out that N is one of these conserved. Now, I'm so buoyed because I saw a paper just got published that some of the most potent antibodies is to N. I'm also buoyed because a paper just came out that for SARS-CoV patients who had this in 2003, 11 years after the infection, they have a, what we call a memory T cell to N. So what I call the power of N. So what I believe as a scientist is that we need to create a vaccine, and not just to S, i.e. the spike, we need to create a vaccine also to N. Now, there's a trick to this, because if you notice, the N is on the inside of this virus. So how do we bring this N inside a vaccine to the outside of the cell? I'm not going to go into that science, but I think we have a way to do that. So if we can get antibodies to S and N, I think you'll have a stronger vaccine. If you can get T cells to N, you have even a stronger vaccine. But really, 
I think the ultimate is to not only get antibodies to SNN, T cells to SNN, this is a respiratory virus, which means we want to protect your mucosa, your nose, your mouth, your lungs, your guts, which means then we need to go to get even another antibody called IgA. And one way to do that is to give the vaccine by mouth or through the nose or under the tongue, like the polio vaccine. So that is the, the third approach. So if I were to ask myself, if I were to design, we're going to outwit this and create what I call the ideal vaccine, I get it. If we're rushing to making this S, I think that's fine. But if you really want a vaccine that will give you long-lasting, what I call durable um, protection, I believe you need S plus N. I believe you need antibodies. I believe you need T cells. And I believe, most importantly, you need mucosal IgA immunity. If you get all three, you're golden. Now, there's one problem. As you age, your immune system, your ability to actually generate an immunity, and unfortunately, this virus hits the elderly, as we all know. So there's a, a yet another opportunity to find a way to stimulate that immune system with a thing called IL-15 uh, once you get the vaccine so that you can get better T cell immunity for the patient the age population. So this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. Uh, this virus is here to stay. It's been 40 years and we still haven't gotten a vaccine for HIV. This virus is one of the smartest viruses and we've got to figure this out and we've got to follow the science and we've got to follow the biology and I believe we're going to treat this virus as if we're treating cancer. So I'm hopeful uh, that we are there, we're getting there, or that the scientific community working together as a whole will be able to get there. And I'd like to hear Bill's opinion on you know, what we've, I've just given sort of a complex lecture on how to build a vaccine. Well, I think you've just heard a, a master take you through very interesting aspects of what we need for a vaccine. Let's go back and sort of connect the two parts of our discussion here. Should we just go on as we are and wait for a vaccine or a drug to save us? I think the answer is no. This is a really complex virus and maybe we'll be lucky the first time out of the box with a vaccine. The chances of that I think are less than 50-50 that the first vaccines will be fully effective and fully safe. It's going to take, I think, as Patrick said, it's a marathon. I remember something from the Old Testament Ecclesiastes, the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, nor riches to men of understanding, but chance happeneth to them all. That is where we are. We have men of understanding, like Patrick and many others working on this. We may be lucky, which is always a good thing to be, but this virus has the habit of coming back year after year after year, all its cousins do. No reason to think this one won't. And it fools around with your immune system. I've actually counted in SARS, the virus before this, 11 different proteins this virus has to jimmy our immune system, to get into us and get out so we forget, and maybe to erase some of the immunity once we have it. It's gonna be a formidable adversary. I and my friends have struggled with AIDS for 40 years, as was mentioned, and we still don't have a vaccine. Sometimes we're lucky, sometimes we're not. Let's hope we're lucky this time. So the first message is, don't count on science to save you, although it might. Count on our own behavior and our own organizational abilities to save us. That is far more reliable because we've seen it work around the world. At the same time, don't put your money on the vaccines but don't give up hope. Uh, Professor, one last thing before we turn to viewer questions. Um, is there, in terms of when we get uh, uh, the first vaccine, whether it's an ideal multifaceted vaccine or not, when the first one comes to market, who do you anticipate will be able or, or should be first in line to get it? What should the public expect? Uh, should everybody expect that they can go out and, and, and get this vaccine? Or is there going to be some sort of process and, and that, we're really going to have to prioritize certain cases here. Well, in a sense, we already know the answer to your question. The first people to get the vaccine are members of the Chinese army and members who work for the party, Communist Party, in China. 
they are already in line to get a vaccine, which has been approved by the Chinese government. They're getting the vaccine as we speak. So we know the answer to that. That they're not Americans, they're not British, they're not French, they're not Africans, they're Chinese. Is it a wise thing for them to do? In my opinion, it's very unwise because you don't know if it's safe, you don't know it's effective, but that is the answer. Now, when it comes to the United States, I have my preferences. I would say that the first people who should, if we have a vaccine that seems to be safe and effective, the first people who should get it is frontline healthcare workers. Those people are exposed day in and day out. They're our most precious asset. They go and we're defenseless. The highest infected group in the world, in any country, are the people we need the most. In Spain, the infection rate of healthcare workers is twice that of any other group, even their migrant groups. The same is true. If you want to look at a group that's equivalent to the highest rate of infection in a underserved area of Los Angeles, look at your healthcare workers. That would be the first group. The second group would be people you know who are exposed, somebody who lives in the household or who is likely to be exposed. And I would say the third group, just from what our discussion has been, is not the people who are most protected, but the people who are most vulnerable. Let me give you a story from Singapore. Singapore is a very well-organized government. They have fantastic research. I've written a book on their healthcare system. They are really good at what they do, but they had an enormous blind spot, which is their foreign workers. They took care of all the citizens and foreigners who were there, except their foreign workers, and they still haven't tamped down that infection. If there's a vaccine, they should get it first, because the rest of the population has, the, the ratio is about 100 to 1 in that population versus the rest of the, the Singapore population in terms of infection. That's who should get it first. So that's my own impression. I don't know if that is going to be what happens in the United States, but I think that's what should happen. Thank you for that. We're going to introduce a segment now that we are calling Your Safety, where we will address readers' questions. And if you'd like to send in a question to be addressed on a future program, you can write to this address, secondopinion at latimes.com. Our first question comes from Jennifer H.G. in the city of Los Angeles. And her question is, once we have been infected or have antibodies, can you be reinfected? Dr. Sunshang, do you want to take that one? Well, I think as Bill's mentioned, the answer is, I believe, yes, because this um, virus, you know, there's an a infection called measles, when you call it amnesia. It generates, it has in the capability, as Bill says, going in and getting out. Um, and I think we really have some case reports of people getting infected, reinfected. And so the answer, unfortunately, the po possibility is yes. Having said that, the science is still evolving. For us to actually make a definitive uh, answer, we need more time uh, and, and, and knowledge to, to know that. But my guess is yes. Our next question is from uh, Georgina Lort from Orange County. Uh, her question, and I'll put this one to you, Professor Hazeltine, is, is it a good idea to go to the gym right now? Is that safe? Uh, it is probably the least safe place you could possibly go, other than being on a long airplane trip. Uh, gyms are filled. They're, usually they're small. They're in basements. The air circulation isn't the best. People are pumping their lungs as hard as they can, and there's all sorts of people coming and going, and the sanitation of those places is not good. If you want to find a place that's heavily infected, take a swab off of one of the uh, handles, on your exercise machine or the barbells. Um, so the answer is it is a very high risk place to go. And of all the places that open, bars and gyms should probably be the last. And what is the reason with bars too? I've seen that that is about as dangerous a place as you can go to. It's because of the proximity to other people. What's the main reason behind bars being so dangerous? There's a very simple equation for catching this virus from someone else. You're in a small space that's enclosed, like a bar. Bars generally are the smallest place in a hotel lobby or anywhere else. People like to be packed into a bar. You're close to each other. The air isn't circulating very well. And people are disinhibited by the alcohol they're drinking. All of those is a recipe for a high rate of transmission. And in fact, that's exactly what you see. Uh, and so 
it's uh, I say if it's not a bar, if it's not a barbell, it's a bar. <laughs> and it makes a lot of sense. And it's easy to remember that. Uh, Dr. Soon let me put another one to you, a question from Joel Brodsky uh, in Lakewood. Uh, Joel writes, I notice people pulling their masks down below their nose when they wear them. How much does doing that degrade the protection toward others? Completely, basically. You may, you know, uh, the path is through your respiratory tract. That's where you breathe. <laughs> uh, this virus goes down to what we call the deep lung. So, you know, pulling the mask down, in fact, one of the elements of a mask is to have what we call a tight-fitting mask. Really, you're wearing a mask for two reasons. One, to protect yourself, but more importantly, as importantly, to protect your community around you. So, if you have a mask that has a valve, which makes it easier to breathe, but you're infected, you're actually producing the viruses through that valve. So, it's important to have a mask, and this is what we, we showed, uh, that is completely fitted. So pulling it down um, from your nose is equivalent to having a valve. And you either emitting, and meaning you contaminating the world, or you inhaling and contaminating yourself. So I, I, I wouldn't recommend. In fact, that's tantamount to not even wearing a mask. What about a, a sort of cloth mask that's not an N95, that's not real tight, but that does cover the nose and mouth what sort of effectiveness does that does that give one? Yeah, so it's very clear, right, that these cloth masks themselves, especially if they're tightly woven in two layers, are effective. I'm exploring right now, as we speak, um, a, a, a mask that has been graphene imprinted. It's from a cost perspective, and they've been tested, and can actually reduce the viral load to two logs. Um, there's now a mask that I'm exploring. Um, where it's cloth and, and, and because of the graphene it takes the temperature away, but it has a filter, like a HEPA filter, that you can put in between. So it's all about physical properties of this virus, which is basically a nanoparticle in a droplet that is what we call a microparticle. So uh, the physical uh, properties of a physical barrier w helps and is effective, and if you don't have a mask, that's that's important to have. There's another alternative, especially for kids who have a, young kids who have a hard time with masks, and that's a face shield. It's not protecting viruses coming in, but it can protect, almost like a mask that protects droplets from coming out. And it also reduces the amount of virus that may get in through your eyes. So face shields are important to consider as well. And they make them in very friendly kid sizes now. They have Paw Patrol, they have uh, Star Wars, they have a lot of the things the uh, young kids uh, uh, like now. So I would say, and they're much easier for young kids, but really young kids to wear. Uh, my grandchildren like them, and it's something I'd just like to get into the, into the discussion. It's not just about masks. Face shields should be considered too. Professor, I want to ask you a question. Uh, it's from Ann Sirota in San Fernando Valley. And she writes, are there new guidelines on the deliveries of groceries and packages and mail? If we have a partly covered porch, uh, if the delivery person is or is not wearing a mask, if we have the frozen food, how long do we wait before we go outside to pick up a package? First of all, it's important for the delivery person to be wearing the mask. That is the risk you're ha you have there. What is on his hand or her hand and what's uh, coming out of their, uh, out of their uh, breath. So it's very important that delivery people follow the guidelines. Uh, and when they're taking something to your porch, whether you're on their porch or not, they're using the guidelines. Um, the studies that I've seen suggest that there's very, very low risk of the actual picking up the package, even if somebody were infected, from you get infected from picking up the package. Most infections, it turns out, happen through droplets and aerosols, not through contact on the surface. So the chances are low. I don't think you have to wait very long before you pick it up. Somebody might walk off with it if you leave it out there too long. Dr. Soon Chong, a question from Jennifer HG in Los Angeles. The question is, how often should people be getting tested uh, if they have to be in the public as an essential worker or just a citizen who doesn't have anybody else to go shopping for them uh, and so forth? Well. Look, there's an ideal and there's a practical. Uh, the ideal would be 
if you're out and you're essential worker and you're out there every day, um, you should be tested often. I mean, realistically, you you know, clearly in the White House, they, they test it sometimes twice a day, but I don't know if that's realistic today because of the absence of testing facilities that, and the return. The most important thing about the test, in my mind, is um, to get it back in time because really the question, are you incubating? And if you get the test results 10 days later, it's almost worthless. Um, I think if you feel you've been exposed, frankly, I would assume you're infected regardless of the test or not. And then the third thing is, what is the test? Now, people talk about tests and tests and tests. Is it an antibody test? Is it a viral test? Is it a PCR test? Is it this safer test? Is it? And unfortunately, all these tests, there's also these false negatives. So the answer to your question is, if you're an essential worker and working in the hospital, and, and ideally, you should be tested daily. The Indian government has just approved an antigen test. Now, the virus, as Patrick showed you, has RNA and it has proteins in it. You can very sensitively and accurately pick up the RNA with a PCR test. That's what everybody's doing today. But there's an alternative way is to measure the proteins. It's not as sensitive. It will miss some people. But the way the Indian government is using it is really encouraging, and I think we ought to think about it. And that is, everybody they screen, they first screen with an antigen test. And it picks up about half the infected people. They then know immediately within 10 minutes to 20 minutes that that person is at risk of spreading the virus and that person is at risk for getting sick. Half the people, they already know instantly. The other people, they test everybody anyway because they know it's not perfect. Now, there's the other great thing about that test. It's very cheap. I think you can get down the test, the real price, down to about five cents. So a five cent or 50 cent or even a dollar test that you can get the answer and do yourself through saliva in 30 minutes is, I think, going to be a game changer. India is in the lead right now in doing that. There's other countries that have emergency use authorization. We actually have such a test that the FDA has given emergency use authorization to. So what Patrick has been talking about, instant test results, maybe we can get them for half of the people. That's better than zero of the people, I can tell you. It's not all the people. We'd like to do better for all the people. But over time, I think those tests are going to get better and better. So that's optimistic from, I think, the point of control and what uh, Patrick is uh, really talking about. Professor Hazeltine, a question from Chris Barron in Irvine. Uh, what is the protocol for rubber gloves? Can you wash them out with soap and warm water, or should you just be disposing them after a single use? I'll give you an example. I go to a gas station. I have in the compartment next to me a whole bunch of disposable rubber gloves. I put it on, and before I get back in the car, I take it off and throw it away. Why? Because it's picked up what's ever on that handle. So you got to remember that whatever you've touched could still stay on your glove. And so you would wash your hands, either throw away the glove or wash the glove like you wash your hands. We appreciate all the readers who uh, wrote in with, with questions. Uh, Good to get all this information out. And if, again, if you'd like to have a question answered on a future show, uh, secondopinion at latimes.com. That is the email address. You can write to us there. Uh, and we hope to have our experts uh, responding to more questions on future shows. Uh, as we wrap up, I just want to thank both of you for your time and expertise on all of these issues. I know that everybody watching this uh, has gotten a lot of great information out of this and gotten a lot smarter. Uh, we talked a little bit about getting to that point in the conversation where we could try to be optimistic about this in some capacity. And so as I ask you both uh, for closing thoughts uh, before we say goodbye, maybe we can uh, include in those closing thoughts, hopefully, uh, some reason for optimism as well. Uh, Professor Hazeltine, uh, I'll give it to you first, uh, and then Dr. Soon Chong, and then we'll, uh, we'll say goodbye. Professor? Well, again, as a biologist, I think about evolution, and that evolution is very clever. It made us. But evolution did something when it made us that has taken it a step beyond toward adaptation. If you think of the essence of what I was talking about with viruses, adapting to its environment. 
And the virus is doing what machine intelligence is doing. It's throwing lots of random mutations and seeing what fits. And it's been very powerful. It creates the entire living world. But with us, there's something better. We have intelligence, logic, deduction, and historical knowledge. And that allows us to adapt much faster than the natural world could adapt. We are clever. And the reason we are so successful is we adapt not over five or 10 generations. We can adapt over 10 minutes. We can adapt really quickly to what's going on. And we are going to beat this. Our evolution has given us a gift, the gift to adapt to change circumstance. This virus has changed our circumstance in a really dramatic way. I'm speaking to you from Connecticut, which I never would have been in if it weren't for this virus. I've adapted. We all can adapt really quickly. And that is what ultimately will save us. Professor, thank you. Uh, Dr. Soon Chong? This is basically virus versus man right now. And as Bill said, not only ability to adapt, but to truly use our intelligence. And what's exciting about our intelligence today, we've got what I call an augmented intelligence. Because for the first time, we have things like genomic sequencing, machine learning, computing, molecular dynamics. So the opportunity for us not only to, to adapt, but to actually learn and learn fast exactly what we need to do. I have now seen, um, both in our own group as well as the science around us, multiple avenues of getting at this. Let's just talk about them first. The first one is the spike. So there is now neutralizing antibodies, what we call monoclonal antibodies, that not only we've seen in our lab and other labs, that, that is now can be manufactured. So this convalescent serum, so to speak, can now be manufactured so that you can actually reduce the death at least. If you're infected, you can give these neutralizing monoclonal antibodies and block it. The reason we're so scared is because it kills us. So that's the first thing. That's there, will be there, will be there quickly. There's now evidence that there are going to be drugs like antivirals, not just remdesivir, but drugs that can actually block the replication of this thing. So now we can block this thing like a Tamiflu for people to understand how you do flu, but it doesn't really do that strong, but this is truly out there. And then finally, the vaccine is very real in my mind. I'm very excited about the fact that you, we're not only going to get antibodies, we're going to get these memory T cells. Now that is a sh shot that is yet in the unknown, because just like HIV, we don't know that. But at least we have a shot now, because now there's now modernized ways of making these vaccines using the genetic sequences and using viruses to attack viruses where the genetic sequence can go into your body and actually create knowledge for your own immune system. And then finally, uh, I've now seen evidence of a thing called an ACE2 decoy. This thing uses ACE, and there's an opportunity to create what we call a decoy of ACE in your body so that it can trick the virus not to actually go into your normal receptors. So there's a cadre of elements to get at this virus. However, having said that, we have to be patient. We have to adapt to our circumstances, like Bill has said, and not create this crazy spiral out of control. We've got to damp it down, save our lives, and be a little patient while the scientists are working, but we are getting there. I, I do see light at the end of that tunnel. Great to hear, gentlemen. Thank you both, Dr. Patrick soon Shong and Professor William Hazeltine. Really appreciate your time and expertise. That does it for this debut edition of the Los Angeles Times series, Second Opinion, where we'll look closely at matters of health, science, and technology. I'm Eli Stokels in Washington. Thank you and goodbye. Mm -hmm.